Yeah, good morning, uh, good afternoon in Europe. My name is Sven Luna, I'm president and CEO of the European American Business Organization. It's uh, a first for us. We're using the space for the first time, which was built out of the Chrysler building. So we're right in the heart of Manhattan. And uh, we're doing our first hybrid event. So we have an audience uh, here in the room. And I, I just ask you to turn off your cell phones or at least mute them so that they're not ringing while we do the event. And we have uh, people obviously watching us online. So I just want to give you a quick overview first of the European American Business Organization. We're a consulting company. We do outreach campaigns for our clients, set up B2B meetings with potential customers, distributors, and so on. We are part of the enterprise network, which the European Commission set up uh, um, 15 or so years ago. And uh, we were the very first uh, uh, point of that network, or the previous network, even in the United States. Furthermore, we help customers here and in Europe with regulatory compliance support, some legal support to direct them in the right direction. Uh, visas, which is obviously a big issue and continues to be a big issue. And we do market competitive analysis. We inform about trade shows, help with trade shows. We uh, have uh, a lot of things we can do, and we just have to ask us and we can help. And I don't want to take too much time away from what's really the, at the center of today's presentations. I do want to mention that I'm the Hamburg ambassador uh, in the port city of Hamburg, Germany, here in the United States, or at least in New York and down to Washington area. There are 33 such ambassadors in uh, the world, and it's a network that was set up um, many years ago to just uh, show more presence of Hamburg in the world. But it's really very nice in this context to mention that uh, for the third time in a row, Hamburg has topped Germany's Smart City Index uh, this year. And it shows how Hamburg is involved in IT, artificial intelligence, digitalization. And that will lead into the further discussions today. I now come to the um, presenters, and uh, there is obviously the law firm of Field Trisha and uh, Oliver from Hamburg, who will be the first one to speak. Uh, the law firm is a British law firm, and it says, build around people with all their diversity and striking a healthy balance between legal excellence and the down to the practical approach to clients' needs which from my experience looking at websites of law firms is a little bit different from the, the usual approach that you see. They have uh, 25 offices in 11 countries, mostly European countries, but also in Silicon Valley and in China. Now Oliver Azuma, who's going to take over from me in a moment, is a partner there. He advises clients on all areas of law affecting information technology and dig digitalization with a focus on IT contracts, data protection, IT security, and e-commerce. So it's a, it's a huge portfolio. And uh, he also can answer any question as, questions as far as GDPR, the general data protection regulation, is concerns uh, a uh, regulation that uh, at, certainly at the very beginning was uh, feared by many people here, there were many seminars about it. And uh, in addition to being a very busy lawyer, I assume he serves as president of ECO, the Association of the Internet Industry, and chairs the Data Protection Committee of the European Internet Service Providers Association, association which is based in Brussels. So, the second speaker, who is not in New York, but will join us uh, virtually, is Ivo Ivanov, who is the CEO of EECIX, International and COO of EECIX 
Tech School. He has more than um, 10 years experience in the regulatory, legal, and commercial internet environment. And he personally will tell us what this company actually does because most people just say, well, I go to the internet and I connect. But how do you connect? And that you can explain why it is so important what they're doing worldwide. They have uh, installations uh, in uh, many countries, cities all around the world, and we will talk about that. His educational background uh, is very impressive. He focused on law and business. He went in German, English, Russian, and Bulgarian, graduated from a German business school, and holds two law degrees from the University of Sofia and Bonn. And uh, he worked as a lawyer now, he works more as a business person in this technological challenging field. And with that, it's my great pleasure to turn over to Oliver, who will continue. And again, if you have questions, you can ask them afterwards in person or send them to the chat. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Sven Schule. Um, hello, everyone uh, here in this beautiful uh, space that we meet today uh, in the middle of Manhattan. And uh, hi, everyone that is following us remotely um, on your screens. Um, I'm very happy that you are hosting us here today with your organization, Sven. Thank you for that. And thanks, everyone, for coming um, into, into this um, beautiful space and everyone welcome who joins us on the screens. Um, so what we do today, I think, is a very important um, thing. We will not only speak about legal requirements for international data transfers, um, but I'm very happy that we will hear Ivo afterwards, who will present us really the interconnection system that uh, DigX is providing. This will be um, new for many of you, um, but I think it's very enlightening, and I think it's a perfect fit when we speak about uh, international data transfers that we, only, that we also understand what happens from a technical side and how, from a technical perspective, data can be secured and protected. The background of my presentation actually is um, a, a verdict of the European Court of Justice that many of you will have heard of, um, the so-called Schrems II decision um, that kind of turned upside down the, the legal requirements um, for international data transfer. And I think we are all aware of the fact that in a globalized economy, um, we are all dependent on uh, data exchange and data transfer between countries, uh, in particular um, between the European Union uh, and the US. And I have a small graphic here just to explain what happens in many companies. Many of you will be aware of that. And I took the example of the exchange of HR data. So imagine you have a company that is based in the US which affiliates uh, affiliate companies in Germany and Italy, and they are using uh, an HR software system by a provider that's based in the US. That's what happens on a day-by-day -day basis in many multinational um, operations, um, because HR data in the most cases are administered um, centrally in the mother entity um, and not individually or on site um, at the European affiliates. So that is just one example, but almost everyone understands, but this is not it, right? Because data transfer is everywhere, not only with regard to HR data, um, but uh, almost every uh, business relation requires that you exchange information and data, that you use software as a services, which means that the software um, is not um, operated on site, but provided um, by a cloud company um, that might be um, in the US and that automatically, that automatically requires that you exchange data and transfer data with these companies. So it's a very practical challenge that we are facing here. And I will start by explaining a little bit the background of the legal requirements under the GDPR for such international data transfer. Um, so the basic idea of the GDPR for international data transfer is that you need a legal ground for every international data transfer um, that, that you carry out. And the GDPR provides for a number of such legal grounds. And you see the four most important uh, columns on this slide. And the first one is um, the so-called adequacy decisions. There are a number of um, countries where the European Commission officially approved that their regulatory 
regulatory framework for privacy for data protection is equivalent to the one that we have in Europe. And if you uh, have such an approval, a so-called adequacy decision, you can transfer data to such countries without any um, additional requirements. Um, many of you will be aware of the fact that there is no such decision for the US, which means with regard to the group, European US data transfer, we need to rely on other legal grounds. Then there are, um, let's jump to the third column, maybe uh, so-called binding corporate rules. Um, a number of multinational um, companies are relying on these binding corporate rules. That's a very complex challenge. Um, so maybe not the ideal solution for everyone. It's a very, in a very individual setup um, of documentation uh, and compliance that needs to be um, approved by the competent, competent data protection authorities. Um, so something, um, well, as I said, a solution maybe for the biggest multinationals, but not for the many, many medium-sized or even bigger companies um, that have to rely on international data transfer as well. Then we have some bigger uh, derogations. Um, I will not go too much into the details for that. The most important ones actually are or have been um, the ones in the second color, um, the so-called appropriate safeguards, um, and amongst them, the standard contractual process. These will be subject um, to, to my presentation today. And um, until uh, July last year, the so-called privacy shield. But that was exactly the solution that has been challenged by the activist from Austria, Max Schrems. Many of you have heard of him. That's why the, the verdict of the European Court of Justice is called the Schrems 2 decision. Why 2? Because it has already been the second time that he challenged um, privacy requirements in Europe. Uh, and I believe it will not have been the last time. So uh, sooner or later, we can expect a trans free decision. I'm very sure about that. Um, so these two very important safeguards um, have changed now that we have this verdict in place. The privacy shield um, has been uh, invalidated, has been killed by this decision of the European Court of Justice. It's not valid anymore. And you, you might or might not know that around 5,000 companies relied um, only on this solution. So from one day to the other, um, this was not a legal solution anymore, uh, which um, brought huge legal uncertainties um, to a huge number of international companies that have relied on this very important um, legal ground. What remains? Is the standard contractual clauses. Um, however, um, there is a different approach because the European Court of Justice said basically you can rely on the standard contractual clauses, but there are some additional requirements. Um, and as a consequence of this verdict, the European Commission has approved a new set of standard contractual clauses only in June this year. Um, and I will um, present here today about what that means, what are the different and what do we need to do in order to um, find a compliant way of implementing these standard contractual clauses when you are transferring data from the EU to the US? By the way, transfer does not necessarily mean that you transfer data in a physical way. Even accessing data by a company from the US um, in the EU would be considered as transfer under the GDPR. So even if there's no, from a technical perspective, no transfer mechanism, um, the pure access of data, for example, HR data of an FDBA would be considered as transfer as well, which means you need the same um, legal grounds for such operation. Good, so let's have a short look in, into the most important um, sections of this verdict from the um, European Court of Justice. First of all, um, the privacy uh, shield um, has been invalidated. That's something I already mentioned. Very interesting and important to understand the challenges we have to deal with is um, the, the reason. The ECJ pointed out that the US does not provide a data protection standard that is essentially equivalent to uh, the one that we have in Europe, to the GDPR, because for a number of reasons, not only because they do not meet the principle of data minimization, which is a core principle of the GDPR, but in particular with regard to um, several sections of um, surveillance um, legislation and surveillance measures that are possible under US law. That was the key argument why the European 
we have just said, um, this system does not um, provide an equivalent system in terms of privacy and data protection as we have it in the EU. Now, that's very important to understand for um, the background. And with regard to the standard contractors office, um, the ECJ also made um, a very important uh, statement and decision because it basically said standard contractual clauses are contracts. And contracts between private parties or between, between affiliates um, of, um, of a group of entities, um, well, are only to a certain extent the right mechanism um, to guarantee data protection also in a third country because the contract um, can never circumvene um, ways that authorities, that surveillance agency have by law, um, a, a contract that we parties can, can never supersize. But even that, uh, so, um, and the key message from the ECJ was that because this is only a contract, there might be the need for the adoption of additional supplementary measures that we need to implement in order to further rely on the standard contractual process as a legal basis. And that's the big difference compared to the past and to the time before we had this verdict. In the past, it was um, sufficient and compliant to just rely on the standard contractual process. That was good, you were set, and that has changed now. And um, we will see that this means a lot of additional burden and compliance efforts for companies because, because it's far more than just putting together the right clauses from this new set of standard contractual clauses. You see the key differences or main differences on this slide, um, whereas the old set of the SCCs only provided three different sets for combinations, and we now have four different modules that you can pick and that you have to combine. And how you combine them combine them depends on the um, individual roles of companies, um, for example, in a group of companies, but also between business partners. And um, for example, when there are a processor or a controller, and um, that is something that you need to identify in order to be able to um, put together the right set of clauses. And then what is new as well, we have a so-called dropping clause. That means multiple entities um, can um, uh, be uh, added to such a contract, which is much more flexible. And again, uh, in particular for a group of entities, um, uh, a very flexible approach, basically. So if we come back to the slide that I showed in the beginning, this would mean that you just would, in the past, just would have to enter between these different entities into the right set of contract, and then you have been fine. Now the challenge um, those, as I said, um, far beyond. Why is that? Um, first of all, what you can do to make your life easier, you can use legal tech. That's what we did at Field Fisher. We created a tool um, that puts automatically um, the set of clauses that you need for your individual situation. Um, I have just um, a short um, presentation here about that. You can do it in five minutes. You have to answer like 10 questions. Uh, and then you're basically set at the end of the process and you will have a combination out of these four modules for your individual case. That sounds like a perfect uh, and very comfortable solution, but that's only half of the truth, to be honest, because um, you need to individualize this. That is um, very important. Uh, and we see that on this slide. Um, of it's it's a good basic to work with, but then you will see that there is a lot of individual information that needs to be filled out. And of course, you need to be sure and aware of the specific roles of the parties as whether a processor or a controller. If you are not able to answer this question correctly, and um, you will not be able to use the tool. Uh, but even if you are, have answered everything correctly, um, as shown here, Parts of this uh, agreement needs to be filled out individual, uh, individually. That's nothing that we can do in an automated process. And the most important part of the challenge is that you need to carry out the so called data transfer impact assessment. Um, that is explicitly regulated in uh, section 14 of the uh, standard contractual clauses, which you see here. And as everything in the GDPR and about European data protection, also, this is about documentation. 
but risk assessment and documentation. So you're required um, by law to um, individually assess the data transfer situation, the roles and responsibilities of the party that exchange data, the purpose, and in particular, the um, security measures of the organizational measures that we have implemented in order to protect such data transfers. And then you have to do a risk assessment that very much takes into account the legal framework um, in the target country, in this case, the US. And that is uh, quite a complex challenge, um, not only with regard to the US, but if you transfer data, let's say, to Brazil, um, or to China, you need to deal and to assess the privacy situation in those countries as well in order to be compliant um, with the use of these standard capture <coughs> clauses. Um, it's good that we have guidance for that, which um, is, um, however, a pretty complex guidance and recommendation. Um, we have the second version now in place of the European Data Protection Board which is the umbrella association of all European um, data protection authorities. And they um, have provided um, around 40 pages of guidance about what you need to do in order to set up and carry out such a risk assessment and how you can, uh, and what kind of supplementary measures um, might be um, the right ones in order to comply with these challenges. And what the recommendation basically recommends is a six-step approach. You see the different steps here, and already that demonstrates that this is quite a complex challenge. Um, and the most important part, as, as I said, um, is not only to assess the legal framework in that specific country you're transferring data to, um, but in particular to come to the conclusion if for this individual case additional measures are required, and in particular what kind of measures this could be. Now, basically, you can think about contractual measures, you can add contractual obligations into the, in the, into the contract, and you can implement organizational measures uh, in terms of how is this process working. But the most important one, and that's what has been stressed not only by the court, but also by the European Data Protection Board, are the technical security measures. And first and foremost, it's about uh, encryption. And um, there is an annex in this recommendation that summarizes um, what the requirements for encrypt, uh, encryption for such um, supplementary measures are. Um, and this is only an excerpt from these requirements. It's a pretty long list. Um, and the most important message is it's always a case to case decision. There is no one size fits all um, solution. Um, for example, if you are dealing or transferring health information, which is considered as so-called sensitive or sensible data under the GDPR, you will need stronger encryption and security measures as compared to pure business data, email addresses from the business context in the US. Uh, so it's always an individual decision, um, but that does not mean that you can just not do nothing. Uh, the minimum challenge that you have to comply with is you need to carry out a documentation, you need to carry out a risk assessment. If the risk assessment comes to the conclusion in this specific case, there are no additional measures needed because we are already fine on a very high data protection and security level, then you might be good. Um, but there will, will, will be many, many cases where this is not sufficient and you think about technical solutions in order to be um, compliant from a, from a legal perspective. That is the overview. That is what I um, wanted to present you today. So it is challenging. Um, you all will be aware of the fact that unfortunately um, under the GDPR, extremely high fines can be imposed on companies. And only in the last year, there have been um, uh, in some fines um, carried out about 1 billion uh, euro by the different European authorities. So it's a serious topic. And international data transfer is on the top list of the watchdogs. And so it's important to um, take this into account and be compliant. That's it from my side. And I'm now very much looking forward to the presentation of Evo because Evo can tell us what happens in terms of data security and uh, security measures in the so-called interconnection systems. This will be new to many of you. And um, Evo, we are very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Before I hand over, sorry, Evo. Other questions um, on uh, remotely in the chat, Fedor. And um, if there are questions here in the room, we, are, uh, we can also discuss that after the transition, of course. Um, 
but I wanted to hear if there are questions in the chat from here. Um, well, in the chat, there are no questions so far, but uh, just a reminder, if you joined remotely, just um, ask your questions in the question pane on the control panel and we will answer them at a later date. Okay, so then Ivo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Oliver, and a very warm welcome uh, from London. I'm uh, attending the Capacity Europe, uh, which is one of the biggest uh, telecommunication shows now back in presence and it feels good to have also real meetings and a very good morning to the audience in uh, New York City and uh, to the audience on the screens in general. Yes, uh, the times are challenging if it comes to compliance, but there are solutions. And as we, we heard, uh, there are also smart solutions. I want to touch on the topic of infrastructure because data transfer nowadays happens digitally and uh, this also require secure and compliant infrastructure models behind, behind the different business models and behind also the different uh, stakeholders involved in. Allow me in the first couple of minutes to explain what DICX does and what kind of infrastructure provided DICX is. And thanks again to the team on site in New York for clicking forward. I will use the word next uh, because we have some technical issues so I cannot click um, directly by myself. So on the next slide you see um, you see the uh, the map. Uh, next please, the map of uh, DICX uh, operations worldwide. Um, we do operate as DICX so-called internet exchanges. These are interconnection platforms. We do operate as of now in uh, almost 30 different uh, markets across uh, four continents. As you can see, uh, a, a, a good spread uh, over North America, Europe, Middle East, and uh, Southeast Asia. In total, there are 2,000, more than 2,300 networks connected to the different platforms, um, which makes DICX the largest interconnection ecosystem on the planet. Next slide. If it comes to DICX North America, in North America, DICX is present, is present as of today in four di five different locations, including, of course, New York with the data centers in um, uh, New Jersey, Manhattan and Long Island, but also Chicago, Richmond, Virginia, Dallas and uh, Phoenix in Arizona, which will be live very soon. This is our latest location. Um, next slide. Um, brought a slide illustrating uh, the variety of uh, different uh, participants, those networks, the thousands connected. Next slide. And uh, this slide shows you the um, variety of, um, um, of network operators. Um, the next slide, please. The variety of networks operators uh, consists of, uh, oh, this has not been displayed. Can you can you get yes? Thank you so much. So this slide, a slide, showed you, shows you um, the different type of networks connected to our platforms. Um, actually, every single business model which exists today on the internet in terms of internet network service or business is uh, present on our platforms. We have all the cloud service providers like a well-known name, you see a lot of well-known logos. Um, also content and uh, application providers, also famous brands uh, uh, we use daily uh, in our uh, private and business lives. We do have the so-called content delivery networks uh, um, who are networks uh, delivering the content of others, networks like Akamai, um, um, Cloudflare or Limelight networks who deliver the tons of data which are needed to provide the next iOS um, upgrade by Apple, for instance. Um, then uh, the so-called transport providers and internet service providers, those are um, operators, carriers, ISPs who deliver uh, different carrier services, global transport network providers, but also those uh, cable guys who delivered internet access to our offices and homes. On the upper hand of side of the slide, you see uh, a different type from uh, the so-called wholesale operators, enterprises. And uh, we see a lot of companies, uh, they started using the interconnection ecosystems of DKIX. Well-known brands here from automotive, uh, from uh, uh, construction, retail, uh, hospitality, and so forth and so on. So this shows us how huge the demand on the market for interconnection is. What? 
does this mean? Interconnection stays for actually the direct exchange of traffic, disregarding the type of data traffic. And this is what we do. We, the best analogy to explain what an internet exchange as the DigX platforms does is the analogy with an airport operator. As an airport operator operates the airport as an infrastructure where the different airlines will take off and land securely and exchange traf, uh, passengers and uh, luggage, the same is what we do as an airport operator on the internet. We operate platforms which are data center carrier neutral ones where the different uh, network operators are the airlines. So they directly connect to these uh, platforms and exchange directly, not packages, uh, not the luggage and, and uh, passengers, but packages, packages of data, tons of data. So I hope this helps you to understand um, what we do. And the platforms are per market distributed in many different data centers. So just an example, in the metro of uh, New York City, including Jersey, Manhattan, Long Island, we do um, have access nodes uh, of the platform, DigX New York, in more than 16 different networks with 100 further extended access points. Um, so we cover the, the entire metro and uh, build in this way um, a very distributed and easy to be um, accessed ecosystem. Now the next slide, please. Um, two slides further. Um, our um, unique, uniqueness is based, and a couple of more clicks, please, is based on the uh, fundamentals of growth and uh, um, neutrality. Um, neutrality because of the distributed ecosystem, as I said, the platform is available in different data centers, is an entirely neutral, so we are not a data center operator in the carrier, do not compete with the, with the networks connected to the platform. And for them, it's extremely easy to connect to integrated ecosystem uh, with the, in the, the best, most direct uh, and secure path, because the most direct and interconnection for traffic exchange is the more, sec the more secure this uh, path is. And the exchange uh, in the different platforms is, of course, uh, distributed uh, across the city, as I said, but also cross uh, region wise uh, as the exchange of New York uh, is also interconnected with the ecosystem in Dallas, vice versa, but also across the ocean to the European one and then down the path uh, uh, towards Middle East and uh, uh, Far East. So it's, um, um, it's a unique uh, way to um, assure that the interconnection of traffic uh, run smoothly in the most direct, the shortest path possible, which makes us at the same time also the most secure one. Now, um, two clicks further, please. I want to exchange with you uh, on the next slide the reasons for um, having this type of infrastructure extremely valid for the future. We all have seen that a new digital era has started. What we mean is there is no organization worldwide which doesn't rely on digital, not digitalization only, but also digital services. Even companies from all these segments we see who do not have a service or product, which is probably not uh, online or digital today, they have digital processes behind this. I have a bottle of water in my hand, I hope an entirely non-digital product, but the manufacturer behind this bottle of water has entirely digitalized already today, the manufacturing process, the supply chain, etc. What this does tell us in terms of infrastructure needs, but also uh, compliance needs, which is closely related to the topic of today, transferring data in the best path possible, the most secure and compliant path. And one click more, please. This is the digitalization everywhere for everything and everyone to bring this infrastructure, serving this digitalization in. Uh, a way which is highly secure, transparent, and performable. Why this um, needs to be extremely performable? Because it's about the applications we do see today. One, two more clicks, please. So the applications we do see disregarding one, one click, uh, 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 if in our private or business life, and you see a couple of examples here, 
they have one thing in common, disregarding if we're talking about virtual desktops, collaborative work applications, video conferencing, live sports streamings or event sports streaming, online gaming, down the path to e-manufacturing and connected car, autonomous car management, all this reports to the need and the sensitivity of performance. And in our industry, in the interconnection industry, one more click, please. We describe this um, with the term of latency because performance need means the speed of exchange of traffic. And now we translated the needs of latency, which is milliseconds here, to the needs of different applications. Just to give you an example from our life, uh, I blink, as I do now, is 100 milliseconds. Now imagine, and uh, this is what I have displayed on this slide, how sensitive these applications are. Uh, the maximum requirement today for a high def online gaming with really uh, good performance on live TV sports streaming is 65 milliseconds, not lower than this. If we talk about highly, really highly performable communication um, between manufacturers and uh, cars, we're speaking about one to two to three, five milliseconds max. So we see how, how essential the question of proximity of infrastructure becomes to where the different market and uh, industry stakeholders need to interconnect, to exchange their data because of the application sensitivity on performance. And we have translated this to distance. So you see one millisecond means a radius of 50 miles, 65 milliseconds is around the 3000 miles. Um, this tells us one thing, one click more, Latency becomes a new currency in our business and one click more means that infrastructure needs to go as close as possible to where the users are. And this is what we are now starting to develop around the globe. We started this years back, but now it's even more progressing on this. A couple of more clicks, please. Um, we do develop infrastructure as close as possible to where the users are because it becomes extremely essential. And the infrastructure will involve in, next click please, uh, consists of, of different uh, modules. One click more please. The, those are the data center operators. Um, those are the cable operators, the 5G operators, and of course, the interconnection operators as we do represent uh, this industry segment. Uh, one more click please. I'm not sure if uh, yeah, that works sorry. because ah, it's, it's, no problem. Uh, kind of lagging right now. Sorry. Oh. And it's that's okay. Uh, I I I can I can visualize it further as I explain what does mean that infrastructure needs to get as close as possible to the user. It means that data centers are built as close as possible where the enterprises they have their uh, uh, manufacturing, they have their uh, on-prem setups. It means that fiber needs to be placed in the ground. We, we see developments of 5G layer and the interconnection where we are involved in bringing all these different type of networks together needs to get as close as possible to the users. So we'll see more and more exchanges now need to be developed over the next years and uh, we're heavily involved in. But now, what does this mean? And next slide, please. It means that the exchanges as ours need to provide different solutions and not about the geographical densification only as i explained to get as close as possible with this digital infrastructure to where the users are disregarding in is private or business users but also different services and the the more i'm talking now about services one slide more i want to give you an idea about um the service diversification needs because the more sensitive the data exchange becomes, the more um, different the type of data is, or the more um, vibrant the ecosystem becomes in terms of different types of participants, like the enterprises I, I described, financial institutions, e-health service providers, uh, automotive companies, 
the higher the requirements for security, the higher the requirements for compliance, because the data, the traffic data, including also personal data, is so sensitive. And um, one more slide. This brought us to the idea that we as uh, DKIX has um, um, created the, the concept of uh, different type of services related to the type of traffic, including a direct access to cloud connectivity on the platform on separate uh, uh, virtual community uh, level. Uh, we have created the concept of, for instance, a direct connectivity into Microsoft 365 um, um, uh, application computing resources for better Teams performance and uh, Microsoft Dynamic performance, not for better performance only, but also for the best and the most se secure way if it comes to uh, transmission of this data, uh, also in terms of compliance, because the more intermediate uh, that data traffic flow has, the higher the risk of, of breaches and risk of, of, of attacks as well. And last but not least, we have created the concept of a so-called closed user group. A closed user group is a virtual ecosystem for a specific need of an industry segment of one operator interconnecting with different data suppliers and buyers or data um, partnering stakeholders to make sure that this specific type of data is trans transferred in, um, in a compliant, secure, and highly performable way. Let me illustrate this next example first, based on a real life example, digging start with stakeholders from the automotive industry. Next slide, please. Um, we have started uh, proof of concept already working with uh, prominent names from the automotive industry like uh, um, MAN, the, car, the truck manufacturing company, MAN, or um, uh, uh, Daimler, where we are working on improving the performance, but at the same time also efficiency and compliance between the data exchange. Let me illustrate this on the example of the, 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 the connected car. Next slide, please. We know the connected car um, produces a lot of data and, and all of the, the state of art cars today are connected, they are online. 70% um, of the data, almost 70% of the data is in the car. This is not the data which is interesting now if it comes to real time data interconnection. Let, let's look in the others. Next click, please. Around 5%, uh, next click, we have uh, uh, in the so-called communication car to cloud. Uh, next click, please. Another 5% uh, we do have in the so-called communication um, car to car. This becomes also very interesting. And the rest up to the 100% are related one more to car to the environment. The, the information, the data uh, produced by the sensors of the car is exchanged with sensors on the street, on crossroads, on highways, etc. And these 30%, not the 70% of data who, who are in the car produced, the other 30, they're extremely sensitive. They're extremely sensitive because they need the best performance possible. They need a very high level of security because it comes up real time communication and they're extremely sensitive if it comes to compliance uh, because the, the data produced by the car, if we imagine what a smartwatch can deliver as a data today. Now, let's translate this to a car seat with the hundreds of sensors available, with all of the other thousands of sensors of the car, the data which can be produced related to our personal behavior, not as a driver only, but our blood pressure, our uh, body temperature, the, 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 the question, uh, did the driver have a drink or not, an alcoholic drink, the question how the driver feels, um, does, does, does she or he has, has a good concentration mode, etc. This is data which is reality today. This is data is extremely sensitive. So from the legal, and from the security point of view. And we need a new uh, regime for how these data will be exchanged, not only to comply with the framework Oliver has explained about, but also to, to achieve the highest level of security policy uh, possible. And uh, one more click, please. 
this is what we see behind the so-called concept of the closed user groups. I, I have spoken about this. This was the car to environment. One more click. And I think now we do four or five clicks to move a, a bit faster forward because I have explained this is about the, the cloud communication, different routing between the clouds. One more click to make it more um, um, visual. If this exchange of data, one more click, please. Oh, sorry. Is done in a conventional way where a car manufacturer who is now displayed with the yellow dot, the so called OEM, starts to exchange with MPLS circuits and bilaterally with all these examples of stakeholders involved, as you can see, infotainment manufacturers, uh, um, um, different sensors and spare parts suppliers, entertainment companies uh, like Spotify, Netflix, etc. not to forget Microsoft and Google, of course, this creates a high complexity with a lot of, um, let's say, um, risks around this, risks of management, risks of breaches, because uh, the higher the complexity is, the, the higher the risk of, of uh, failures and mismanagement becomes. And we have thought of creating uh, aggregating ecosystems which aggregate many to one, one to many in a protected virtual environment. One more click, please, called a closed user group. This is a virtual environment which allows, in this example, a car manufacturer as a network to aggregate in a secure, compliant environment the different uh, uh, traffic exchange flows with all these different stakeholders, with all the data buyers and suppliers involved in a connected car journey. The effect is an obvious one. It's extremely efficient because it aggregates a lot reduces complexity one more click and which is more important having this protected environment we can make sure or the car manufacturer can make sure that the data protection policy which needs to be um, implemented is a policy valid for all participants in this closed user group that the security policy needed is also valid for all participants. So everybody who has subscribed technically and legally to be part of this closed user group fulfills the same requirements in terms of complex in terms of compliance and security. This is extremely important, and we know that in terms of compliance, this is not only the data privacy issue or protection requirements, but it's also um, the there are also the requirements from sector specific authorities and agencies and the requirements um, from even company own uh, compliance uh, uh, policy standards. So all in this, what does this tell us? It tells us that infrastructure needs to be designed differently for the specific needs in the future of digitalization everywhere. It has to be done in a more protected way more localized way with a strong eye on security and compliance i want to thank you so much and please excuse the certain technical difficulties we had but I, I hope the message came across and i'm really looking forward to have a good discussion in the remaining couple of minutes thank you so much for the attention Yeah, all right. Thank you all for the presentation. Um, so far, there are no questions asked in the chat, but um, if you have any questions coming up after the event, uh, just do not hesitate to ask us and we will make sure to answer it in, um, in the next few days. All right. Thank you, everyone, and um, have a nice day. We have one question um, here in the audience. Maybe we can take that because we are we have five minutes left. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Who was it? Please. Yeah, I just wonder if you have to distinguish between where we protect actually data. I see that you have to protect data in your ecosystem, and I trust that you have a very convincing solution for that. 
I see also what you pointed out is an equivalence between data protection in the US and Europe. I think that the negotiations are still ongoing, that this might be, we might find a solution between the European Union and the US. But the critical question, as far as I understand it, is the access of certain American intelligence organizations to data that hasn't reached the territory of the US, where actually the US protection doesn't even apply. And for, if I see your system that it is even further distributed, doesn't that actually decrease the chance to get regulation on that when you have more points basically where certain services can access data in the world outside the US territory than when you have basically a transfer just from one point to the other point? I uh, thank you so much. I think this question is related to me. I, I, I try to listen very careful. The quality was not a perfect one, but if I got it correctly, you agree that uh, having a more isolated and, and, and uh, uh, secured environment is the right thing to do. And the critical part of it is what asking if the distributed approach doesn't uh, actually decrease the level of uh, control if it comes to to national security and data and uh, further compliance requirements. Is it the correct one, if I translated correctly? Yes, for, for basic oh. operations of intelligence. Sorry. Yeah. So, so then I need to clarify. No, no, I got it. Then I need to clarify. The closed user group concept I have described is a closed user group which is also geographically related. So in this case, translating this to the US or Europe, do we have different layers? The one layer is the, the legal layer that the transoceanal data in terms of personal data exchange needs to be created. The legal compliance needs to be agreed. But if it comes to the local interconnection and the local exchange of data, so the closed user groups need in plural, they need to be created regionally. So to stay with my example with automotive company means that an automotive company which operates globally and has car units globally, and they are uh, 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 a lot of those around, talking about Ford, General Motors, or BMW, Mercedes, you name it, they need to make proper analysis how many closed user groups they need to be able to localize, not because of performance only, as I said, the latency, but also because of specific compliance requirements based on the regulatory framework in specific countries or regions, country US, regions European Union. But even within the US, on a state level, there might be a different requirement in Texas than the, 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 the New York one. So in this case, there even might be, might be a need for different closed user groups localizing also from the compliance and regulatory point of view. This is the infrastructure part of it. Again, not to be mixed up with the general requirement to make sure that the compliance, if it comes to personal data exchange, as Oliver Zuma explained, needs to be in place. Thank you so much. Does this answer the question or do, did I create more, even more confusion? The questioner is nodding, which you have not seen, but uh, the question seems to be answered. Thank you, Ivo. Um, and do we have any further questions in the chat, Peter? Nope, no further questions asked. Okay, then um, we will um, stop the, the recording and uh, the transmission here. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ivo. Many greetings to London. Um, thanks for joining us. Bye bye. Thank you. Remotely. And um, the ones who are here on site, i um, happy to, to discuss anything further and to do a little bit of networking. And great to see you all here. Thank you. All right. <laughs>